You're on, Mark. Okay, thank you, Sherry. Well, as uh, Sherry indicated in the in the program, I'm going to talk about ground penetration and its applications to archaeological investigations and building structure evaluations. Um, just before I get started, yeah, I'm I'm a geophysicist and I've done a lot of different things, but I got involved with ground penetrating radar with the construction of the Los Angeles Metrorail project back in uh, in the 90s and I didn't have a whole lot of experience with it prior to that but uh, in the last 20 years uh, we, we've done quite a bit of work with it and found it to be very valuable. Uh, it, it really has a just a tremendously diverse uh, range of applications. Everything from the smallest uh, concrete structures, uh, embedment of, of different types of rebar and things like that, and voids and honeycombing and concrete to looking for large geotechnical and geological phenomena in, in the subsurface. And so my initial involvement with ground penetrating radar was, uh, was back in 1996 with the construction of the LA Metro Rail system. And we were using it to, well, actually we, we used it to replace a very costly procedure of drilling the head of the tunnel boring machine underneath uh, Wilshire and Hollywood Boulevard and, and Vermont Boulevard to look for abandoned oil well casings. And we came up with a procedure where we, we used ground penetrating radar from inside the, the tunnel boring machine which had an open ground face to scan ahead of each push of the, of the tunneling machine to look for these casings out in front of the, the machine. Uh, they, they, they could be potentially very dangerous because they could have methane gas in them. And if they're suddenly slammed into by the, the tunneling machine, they can, they can rupture and flood gas to the tunnel and cause all sorts of things. So it was quite important at the time. And, uh, and, I had quite a bit of training on it, and that was my first real experience with ground penetrating radar. And since then, we've, uh, we've through my employment with Dames and Moore, and then going on with my own company, Advanced Geoscience, we have done a myriad of different types of applications. Like I said, everything from concrete scanning radar to uh, to looking for earthquake faults in the uh, in the subsurface using GPR. So I'm going to go ahead and get started. I'm going to talk just real briefly about the <clears throat> some of the technical aspects of, uh, of GPR and, uh, and then some of the procedures that I like to use for surveys and then some of the, the data processing uh, products that are derived from GPR. And then I'm going to go into some project examples, which are mostly in the area of uh, archaeological and building site investigations. So to start out with, um, GPR works by pulsing microwave electromagnetic energy into the ground. And this is, this is done by moving an antenna along a surface, and let's just say the ground, for example. And as it moves along the ground, these pulses are reflected back from interfaces that have dielectric uh, constant differences. Uh, dielectric constant is similar to electrical conductivity, it's a little bit more complicated. And that's in essence what these uh, electromagnetic radar waves um, reflect off, those strong differences. And as this graphic shows you, uh, you have a transmit pulse, the transmit pulse goes down the subsurface, and hits the interface, and then comes back. And so it's a time sort of waveform that you're looking at. And it has an amplitude associated with it too, which is, can be meaningful when you look at that type of data. But using this, this, this physics, we're able to essentially come up with a depth estimation too, if we know a little bit about the, um, um, the relative dielectric constant of the ground. And that oftentimes that can be sort of determined empirically. And in essence, we can come up with a depth by just taking half the velocity or travel or half the, uh, half the velocity, which is derived from this, um, this uh, dielectric uh, constant and multiplying it by the travel time. 
down and back to the interface. So we can make some sort of estimates of the, the depth either within a concrete structure or down into the ground using this, uh, this technology. Um, there's, there are limitations to the, to the, to the uh, technology and, and depth of penetration often when you're dealing with the ground, this is a huge limitation. Looking down into soils or bedrock materials, the, uh, the radar wave frequency and the electrical conductivity uh, are, are the key factors here. Higher frequency signals are, are attenuated more quickly. Uh, they, they penetrate less deeply. Uh, lower frequency signals penetrate deeper. Uh, so the, uh, the, also the conductivity of the soil, or, or in some cases building materials that you're dealing with, that affects the, the radar waves absorption into this, uh, this material. And, and with more absorption, you get less depth of penetration. So there's these factors that, that come into play. And typically we tell clients with ground investigations, if you've got a clay soil environment, you, you can expect uh, you know, poor radar wave uh, penetration and uh, less ability to look deep into the ground with, with, with uh, ground penetrating radar. Another limitation is the target, res uh, is the target depth and size. As you go deeper into the earth, it takes um, sort of a broader radar wave to, to image something. And uh, a small target becomes essentially invisible to a broad radar wave, a low frequency radar wave. So in order to see features of very small dimension in the subsurface, you have to use higher frequencies. But oftentimes these things are, are uh, they penetrate less deeply. So there's this, this business of resolution, depth, and size uh, that, that's also a limitation. Um, FCC has recently, within the last 15, 20 years, has come in now and prohibited certain lower frequency ground penetrating radar uh, antennas from being used in the United States, or at least from being sold in the United States. Uh, we have in our arsenal some some older antennas, 80 and 40 megahertz, that uh, that are essentially grandfathered in. But uh, the purchase of newer, lower frequency radar uh, equipment is uh, is essentially prohibited by FCC now. So that's that's a limitation in a, in, a, in a sense. Um, target resolution orientation, uh, the way that things are detected, linear structures such as piping in the subsurface, you have to run somewhat per, uh, perpendicular or oblique to these features to be able to see these waveforms. If you run over the top of something, right on top of it, or, or just parallel off to the side of it, you can't really get an image. So the, the orientation of the target is, is, is also sometimes a key limitation. If you can only you know, run a profile in east-west direction, and the pipeline is, is, is going in the east-west direction, you're not going to be able to, to, to really accurately image that, that feature unless you're able to run north-south or at some northwest-southeast angle across it. So the, the typical ground penetrating radar setup is displayed here. This is a uh, Geophysical Survey Systems Incorporated, GSSI. SIR 2000 recording system there in the, in the little wagon with a battery. It's operated off a 12 volt car battery. And it, the controller there shown with the, uh, the computer screen essentially transmits energy to the antenna in, in a pulse sense. And that's what creates the, the radar, uh, the modulation of the carrier frequency, which is modulated at 400 megahertz here into the ground. And so this is a typical setup for deployment of a ground radar application. For concrete type applications, higher frequency antennas are used. Uh, the, the pictures here show a 1500 megahertz, uh, GSSI 1500 megahertz structure scan system, which is this handheld system shown here in the upper 
left-hand corner. That system is really cool because it gives you, it's, it, it's essentially handheld, it's, it has no cable to battery or anything like that. The battery in, internally within this device puts the power out to transmit the radar signals. And so you can move this device along a concrete surface and, and the, the little screen on the top shows you the image and you can back up and go forward and, and, and sort of re-image what you're looking for. And it's a really, really uh, uh, robust way of investigating structures like inside of concrete walls. And then the other way of looking a little bit deeper is with the 900 megahertz antenna, and that's shown there in the lower right-hand corner. That antenna is uh, run off a, a CERT 2000 system, which is not shown in the picture, but the cable runs to it. So the power comes from that system into the antenna, and it's moved along. This particular case, that is a uh, um, freeway overpass wall. We were looking to see the uh, and estimate the thickness of concrete there, or a bridge wall. That was a bridge wall to Port of Long Beach, actually. The lower frequency antennas are bigger. It just takes a bigger sort of internal dipole separation within the antenna to send out a broader pulse. So this, in this particular picture here, this is an application of a ground penetrating radar survey over in Nevada where we were looking at voids beneath a uh, series of building, uh, proposed building foundations on uh, one side of the Las Vegas Valley. And this is an 80 megahertz ground penetrating radar antenna. And its, uh, it's recording system is deployed in that vehicle in the background. And the antenna has moved along the surface there by uh, uh, a operator that, uh, that controls uh, various points along the ground surface. You can see those red dots. Every time he goes by a red dot, essentially he makes a, uh, a marker click, and that goes to uh, define where you are in that radar profile as it's developed. So just real quickly, some of the survey procedures that I think are very important when you go out and do a uh, any kind of whether it be a ground or concrete scanning radar survey, is some kind of initial testing to first run some testing of different antenna frequencies and gains and digital filtering setups. This is all oftentimes built in to these radar systems. And, and then in doing so, it's, it's important oftentimes to, to go across, profile across a feature that you're looking for. If you're looking for voids at a site, um, either in the foundation or in the earth, go to a known location where one has been identified and then profile across it to sort of fine tune your, your parameters to be able to see that. And then the other thing is survey line positioning, very important, as I indicated uh, previously. Paralleling survey lines, uh, Survey lines that parallel whatever you're looking for, if it's a linear feature, are not going to do the job. You've got to sort of go across these features in some sort of perpendicular sense of be best. And so a series of sur uh, survey lines are laid out with this in mind, you know, to get you across in such a way that you're able to sort of develop reflection patterns from, from the subsurface that uh, they can be used to identify the positioning of various objects and this is very important in looking for you know linear features such as pipelines and um, st structural building elements like we look for grade beams and things like that below foundations and knowing you know the orientation and setting up survey lines to be you know orthogonal to those uh, those features is, is, is important uh, Data processing. All of the GPR systems have some internal data processing in, in the units themselves, whether it be geophysical surveys systems, incorporated equipment, MALA, or uh, sensors and software. There's some of the three bigger companies that make these systems. But in addition to that, there's now software that allows you to sort of uh, post-process the, the ground penetrating radar data and, and to take it uh, uh, and 
fully develop it in the sense that you can you can do more elaborate filtering with it. You can uh, color modulate the amplitude in different ways to look at things. And then thirdly, um, GPR data processing and evaluation um, can be done in a three-dimensional sense. And I've already kind of touched. There's 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 two kinds of of displays that, that are essentially generated. There's uh, 2D profiles, and then there's there's 3D map view images or plan view images. The, uh, the 2D images are, are are like this one shown here. This is an enhanced 2D GPR profile. Essentially, on the vertical axis, it's radar wave travel time down into the subsurface, and you can see on along the horizontal axis various stationing set up on the ground surface as this antenna was moved along. And this particular image shows buried pipe, buried debris, and, and 18 inch uh, water line, and, and then uh, a, a buried surface of some kind below this pavement structure. Using these 2D profiles, you, you always record the data so that you can look at two or more paralleling profiles. And this, in this display, I'm emphasizing just what you can see and how you can know it's oriented by recording two parallel profiles. The one on the top is at distance, Y distance 25 feet, and the, one on the bottom is at uh, Y distance uh, 20 feet. So these things are separated five feet apart. And you can see that there's various reflection patterns that track from one profile to the other. And this is important to, when you're making this evaluation, this is the whole game here essentially with 2D profiling, is that you, you look at how these various, in this particular case, these are pipelines, uh, track across these, these survey lines. In a sense, that's how we're able to sort of map the orientation of features in the subsurface. Um, and once we have these profiles, we're, and we're able to sort of develop this kind of product, in essence, which is a um, a map of of the orientation of pipelines, and not only pipelines, but let's see if I can move the cursor up here. But these are underground fuel tanks here that are adjacent to this uh, this um, gas uh, uh, pump area here. And so we're able to sort of delineate not only the underground fuel tanks here, but the piping leading to, front, to it and various other pipelines to the site here around the buildings and that. So uh, this is all done by essentially moving the GPR antenna along these grid lines that are showing here in, in, in two directions, east, west, and north, south. And then the other thing that I mentioned just previously was in addition to 2D GPR profiles, GPR can also be used to produce three-dimensional plan view renderings of the subsurface, or for that matter, looking into a concrete structure. And this happens to be data that was collected over in Guam on a, um, on a harbor embankment, but it shows uh, essentially two different slices of the amplitude variations from a series of very closely spaced GPR profiles that were recorded together and essentially processed into a cube or a rectangle of ground penetrating radar data. And then that rectangle was then sliced along various horizontal planes to develop these images that you see as you go down at various depth levels into the subsurface. And so this was like 2.7 or 2.8 feet, and then 4.3 feet here, you know, the subsurface. And you can see how certain features come out, uh, you know, with each animation, so to speak, as you, you can actually look at these things by sort of animating your way through them, and you can see various features. A colleague of mine does a lot of work, and he's developed this, uh, this software, which is, um, uh, a product called GPR Slice, and uh, it's available on his website, and I'll give you the name later of the website if you're interested, but he's done work all over the world in archaeology and is able 
to see things like eel ponds below areas in, in Italy where some of the ancient Roman ruins were, were um, uh, sort of still buried in the subsurface. And so it's, it's really cool technology. Uh, here's another image, uh, 3D uh, rendering of some data that we actually collected over near the uh, Vasquez Rocks Interpretive Center where uh, it's kind of an interesting Indian, uh, uh, or I should say Native American uh, historic site. And in this particular case, we were seeing a pipeline that was extending across this, this large area that we surveyed and then various other, what looked like uh, buried concrete foundations. And then an, another alignment over here, this curved alignment, which indicated some former pavement surface, possibly an old uh, road of some kind that the Native Americans had in this area before it was all covered over. And so this, this really kind of demonstrates the power of how you can sort of use GPR to develop these plan view images of the amplitude and look at various things. So now I'm going to talk about some project examples here. The um, first, uh, we'll go into some building site investigations. Last year we did a survey for NASA out at um, Edwards Air Force space and this uh, this uh, Google image shows a uh, aircraft uh, hangar ramp area where they uh, taxi these uh, very expensive aircraft out and they uh, they basically come out of the hangar and then around the corner here and then this uh, series of blue uh, dashed lines here in the case of fire water main this water main broke uh, the pipeline broke and deluged the area with something like, uh, I think it was 150 or 200,000 gallons of water in the span of minutes and washed soil out into this area along the, and buckled up the, uh, the whole area in here and washed soil out into various other seams this direction between the concrete and the asphalt. And we were brought in to kind of, as an initial, investigation to see how bad the creation of voids were underneath this deck. And so we ran a series of GPR profiles in a north-south sense here across this area. And with this, uh, we used a 400 megahertz GPR system. And we were able to uh, delineate uh, a strong amplitude variation here shown by this red right, right beneath the uh, concrete reinforced deck here. These patterns in here that are shown by the cursor are uh, patterns of, of, they're essentially reflections from ground pen, uh, from uh, rebar embedded in the, in the concrete uh, uh, surface here. This is a 16 inch concrete surface. And so below that we're, we're picking up right at the, the concrete soil interface where, where it'd be expected to be a very distinct ref higher amplitude reflection pattern. And this happens to be in an area pretty close to where we estimated the pipeline break was based on a video camera survey. And using this map or this, uh, I should say, using this pattern of reflections, this, this recognition of this pattern of reflections versus the, the undisturbed areas where there's no, been no void creation and here's maybe some sort of smaller void creation here. We were able to put together a, a, a map of the areas where we found these anomalous reflections so that they could sort of use this to now understand the extent of, of void creation in the subsurface here from this, uh, this, this fire water main break that occurred here. So another example here, we, we did a survey so 10, 15 years back before this is actually recorded without digital recording, more than an analog radar recording here. And this was done at a uh, uh, lake, a Bull Lake uh, Dam for the U.S. Bureau of Reclamation in, uh, in um, Wyoming. Here we were investigating again voids below a spillway surface. <clears throat> we ran a series of uh, GPR profiles in uh, primarily the cross direction and then also the uh, longitudinal direction down the dam. 
and we're able to see areas below the rebar reflections, which are shown here, where we picked up higher amplitude, and sort of more chaotic pattern reflections. And these were associated with areas where we measured void thicknesses here. It's uh, eight to 10 inches, seven inches here. And, and then uh, this profile below, there was essentially, you know, good concrete to ground contact. So this, this kind of demonstrates again, you know, GPR's ability to, to detect voids beneath concrete decks. And I say voids because this could be used for a lot of other applications besides just looking for, you know, voids, sort of washout and soil conditions and things like that. But it could be, you could look for bolts and other things of, uh, of interest in, in older building foundations. You could look down below these floors and see things that uh, you know might be indicative of some old uh, historic uh, structure who knows uh, Al Capone's vault or something like that you know <coughs> but um, another project that we did uh, was we went down into a, a lower foundation level of a building at Cedar Sinai Medical Center to investigate uh, what what is the shape of these piles, whether or not they're truly belled caissons or not? Uh, they they had a building that they were sort of wanting to partially use the former foundation to sort of build another building on top, and so we we uh, did a borehole GPR investigation of these caissons, and essentially we we drilled a series of boreholes off the side of the the, the uh, columns there in the basement of this building to run a ground penetrating radar probe, which is shown here. This, this I think it was like a two inch diameter probe. And it, it sort of works down a three inch borehole, you case these boreholes, and then we, we ran these, uh, these ground penetrating radar profiles from the borehole to investigate the shape of these uh, these caissons. And here's an example of some of the, uh, the data, 120 megahertz borehole GPR profile that was uh, recorded alongside one of these, these, uh, these uh, caissons. And we were able to see that in fact, the caissons do, this is time on this axis here, become belled somewhat at the bottom because of the travel time difference here coming down alongside it and then all of a sudden the travel time becomes less because we get closer to the, the side of this, this caisson, which is belled out at depth. So th these, uh, these GPR profiles were uh, basically telling them that yes, indeed, the, the caissons are belled and we were able to come up with some estimation of the, of the diameter of their, uh, their, their bottom uh, most point there. So getting into um, some archaeological applications, we were uh, we were brought out by uh, a consulting firm to come in after a contractor had uh, uh, excavated their way into some um, Native American and um, uh, uh, old Spanish. Uh, grave sites that were adjacent to this uh, this church site in Los Angeles, and the area in um, <clears throat> in uh, brown here is sort of, sort of dashed in is a construction area where they hadn't excavated yet, but right in here is, is an area where they had excavated into and discovered all sorts of coffins and um, various other internments of of uh, Spanish and uh, Native Americans here adjacent to this church and the whole project was stopped. So we came in to, to see if we could determine whether you know, the, the things were localized to that area or in fact they did extend out to other areas here within the, the planned construction uh, area. And so we, uh, we ran a series of ground penetrating radar profiles and and this is sort of a site map that was developed. There's the church here. And here's various features that we detected uh, around the excavation area where they discovered these uh, 
these burial sites. And then some of the data that was used to delineate these things, we, we did uh, looked at 2D profiles. Uh, in this particular case, these are, uh, I think, 200 megahertz GPR profiles. You can see that some of the reflections that we were getting off these things were very subtle, but nonetheless, you could see things. And here, the arrows kind of point to these, these gravesite uh, reflection patterns. And then we, we also sort of use some higher frequency GPR uh, profiling, this with 500 megahertz, and then develop these, these 3D plan view images that you're seeing here. And we could see, we identified sort of several of these, these patterns from these images. And, uh, and, and we're able to sort of put them onto this, this map here. A lot of these come directly from the 3D imaging a lot more clearly than they did from the 2D imaging. <clears throat> and another site that we, we looked at, uh, this was um, for the, um, uh, a historic site that was out in the uh, Western Mojave Desert. It was a former uh, LA Aqueduct work camp. And we were asked to come out and see what we could find on the subsurface around this area with ground penetrating radar before they, they did some, uh, uh, some of their excavations and screening of the soils out there. So this rectangular area here shown in red and then so the little sub area here, we ran a series of uh, GPR profiles across that area and we're able to see on 2D profiles, various uh, anomalous reflection patterns, various depths that we uh, attributed to various cultural features and you could see that there were certain areas that we could we could sort of classify as more or less undisturbed without evidence of burials of any kind based on sort of a clearly a sort of a linear pattern of reflections without without any amplitude uh, for the most part uh, uh, higher amplitude reflections. And, um, and then we were also able to see things such as um, former burial pits too. And this is an indication of some downdrop reflection patterns in this area that indicate um, the bottom of a former burial pit. And here we converted the radar wave travel time to depth on some of these images. And you can see that's two feet there, four feet there. And then also we used the data to develop some 3D imaging of the, of the radar amplitudes in the area. And you can see that uh, these are various slices from 3.4 feet down to 4.6 or 5.4 feet. It's kind of a zone here, 4.6 to 5.4. And, and you see that one feature up here appears to be sort of a rectangular feature that, that comes through on several different uh, depth levels and this this indicates some type of former building foundation in this area uh, possibly like a perimeter footing or something like that yeah, in this corner here and then there's various other scattered higher amplitude reflections down in this end of the survey area that uh, that appear to do be due to various uh, cultural structures or debris that was buried in this area so recently, last year, we got test. We got asked by the uh, Southern California Gas Company to look into uh, how we might survey areas to see if we could actually see Native American burial sites. And so, prior to to meeting with the gas company, I decided to do a little simulation here. And so we went out in the desert in an area where we knew there was a lot of cattle bones. And we decided to sort of simulate a burial pit with bones and run some GPR across it. So this, uh, this demonstrates, uh, um, this is a 400 megahertz setup that we had here with the SIR 2000. And we, uh, we first recorded across uh, an area that we decided to bury some, some bones uh, we'll call pre-burial profiles. In other words, there's nothing here. It's just what, what, what's in the ground prior to us getting there. And then afterwards, at that stake location, which right here, 
we decided to, or we, we dug and buried a series of bones in there at about 2.5 feet to the top of the bone pile. And so this was all buried and backfilled in there. And then we ran over that with the 400 megahertz GPR profile after burial. And then this shows the 400 megahertz data before burial on this side and then after burial on this side. Here's the center stake location where we buried the bones. And you can see that uh, before and after, you know, we, we pick up this reflection pattern right here, which isn't real distinct. I mean, there's a lot of other things in the ground too that appear to be buried around here too. I don't know what this is, but it shows up in both pro sets of profiles. It's, uh, it could be in fact a area where they buried cattle bones to a deeper depth I think the rancher had been using this area to bury things for a long time. And this was incidentally on city property out there owned by LADWP. But um, none, nonetheless, we were able to see a subtle amplitude reflection pattern from, from this feature. And so, you know, enhancing that profile a little bit more, you can see it here. And so, Something as small as cattle bones, which, which could simulate uh, human remains, are detectable to some extent on ground penetrating radar. If, if you know you're an area and that's what you're looking for. You know? And so this was somewhat helpful in, in you know, us formulating a plan to then go to Arroyo Grande, which is a little city near Pismo Beach, California and perform a larger survey, uh, actually about four miles, actually, um, more like two miles along city streets, following the, uh, the proposed alignment of a, of a gas line. We ran a series of 400 megahertz GPR profiles on, uh, on both sides of the center line, on the center line and then uh, two different locations offset on each side of the center line of this pipeline to sort of sweep the area. And in this area, there was known to be uh, various Native American encampments that, that did in fact have uh, uh, burial areas. In fact, one of the neighborhood communities, uh, people would literally, they could, they could put a, um, a hole in the ground to put a mailbox and they'd discover you know, Native American remains in their front yard. So, you know, it was of concern to demonstrate to the uh, Native American uh, uh, tribal members in this area that the gas company was was trying to take and figure out where these, these remains were and, and also to position this pipeline deep enough in the subsurface so it would be below these, these burial areas. So, so uh, we ran this, uh, this, this survey and this happens to show one of the areas, the paralleling GPR profiles where we did in fact detect fragmentary objects uh, that, that we believe to be uh, an accumulation of Native American remains below the city street, right in the pathway here of the, the proposed, this would be the center line right on the pipeline alignment. And you can see we go from an area of just pipeline reflections, and then all of a sudden we get into an area where we have pipeline reflections. Plus we also have these, these more fragmentary type objects here that are producing this more chaotic series of reflections with some higher amplitude. And then we get down here and we see, okay, well there's like also the edge of what looks like a former excavation in this area too. You can see that by that downsloping reflection pattern. So this area was flagged as a um, high probability area of Native American burial remains. And right now the project is currently evaluating you know, how deep they need to go with some other uh, ways of investigating, I think through direct boreholes and some test pits to get beneath this area with the, the proposed gas pipeline. So that's, that's sort of a, a real world geotechnical and archeological investigation using GPR and uh, uh, just demonstrate the real robust ability you know, to detect very subtle features in the subsurface. 
So I think with that, I'll open it up to questions. Uh, pretty much done with the presentation. Uh, thanks, Mark. Um, can you hear us? Yes. Okay, great. I'm going to pass around the microphone for the questions and just let us know if you can't hear the question. All right. Thank you. Um, Mark, how deep can you take those boreholes for the purpose of determining the characteristics of a pile foundation? Well, I, the deeper the better. Um, we could go down, really, it's really kind of just limited with antenna cable um, deployment. If we've got, uh, let's say, 100, we have right now like 150 foot long cable on our system. And we can configure a borehole antenna probably to go down to that depth easily. So I think in most caissons are probably not that deep, but but I, I've actually heard of some very deep surveys where special, uh, very long cabling has been set up. So uh, I'm not sure what the limitation is. I'd imagine you're going to get some signal attenuation, you know, going up, you know, the cable eventually. But we've we've used in the past 200 foot long cables for various applications with very little attenuation. Are you also able to estimate? Uh, case on diameters, quantity, and maybe pile cap configuration with this technology? I would think so. Uh, if, if we were, if we have access to the top of the pile cap, we could do some, some concrete scanning radar to sort of look through the concrete at the back of the soil interface. So, you know, it really kind of depends on access. We looked at a building Last year, project didn't go, but it was uh, it was one of the the former Howard Hughes buildings over there in Via Vista in West LA, and we were going to do a combination of uh, GPR profiling along these uh, these piles. And for that, we were actually going to use two different techniques, GPR and um, and then also uh, a um, uh, I believe it was a magnetometer probe, if I'm not mistaken now, to kind of look at you know, where, where we would do, get a magnetic anomaly of some kind at the very toe of the pile where the steel stopped and, and we were just in soil again. So there's various kind of setups that could be used to kind of evaluate the, you know, the length, uh, the shape, you know, being on one side, knowing where the center line is. If you know where you are relative to the center line of a pile, and you're profiling the side of the pile, I think we can develop, you know, pretty much the whole three-dimensional uh, structure of, of the pile, just knowing it's, it's tip depth too. Uh, we've also used pulse echo techniques and uh, various sonic uh, de devices um, uh, to measure the length of piles. So there's a lot of different things besides GPR, and they can oftentimes be used in conjunction with GPR. Okay, one more question here. Hi, Mark. So how do you determine um, what frequency you're going to use? Is it the higher the frequency, the, the, the better results, or not necessarily? Well, we always try to go with the higher frequency uh, setup, and and in some cases we know that you know if we're going to be looking, let's say, down below 10 feet for something. We know pretty much that uh, 400 megahertz might not be the best, but that if we know that the soil is relatively sandy, we would say, well, maybe the 400 megahertz will work. So it's kind of like you know knowing what the soil types are, sandier the better, and you know, we're gonna we get more penetration with sandier soils and, and cement than the clayer soils. And, and it's to tell you the truth, there I don't know of any real good um, manual or uh, study that would give you the answer to that question prior to going in the field. You really have to go in the field, I think, and test. And uh, oftentimes I can come pretty close to the right antenna selection just based on experience with surveying in certain areas in Los Angeles, for example, where we do a lot of work and, uh, and limit, you know, the job to just taking out two antennas. But, but oftentimes it's best to really 
to take and test a variety of antenna frequencies. So why is the FCC regulating the um, frequency? Is it interference? Yeah, the lower frequencies, I guess, could potentially interfere with communications. And underground? No, I guess this would be, you know, above ground communications because these lower frequency antennas put out, in addition to you know, focus the energy down in the ground, a certain percentage of the energy goes out from the side and the top of these antennas. And I would suspect that they're just worried about some potential for maybe some sort of police or fire. I, I, to, I'm not really sure why uh, there's so much of a concern, but I, I would suspect since it's FCC, they're concerned about you know communications that uh, police, fire, and you know air traffic control could use that may potentially be. Um, interfered with, you know, by, by the use of these lower frequency antennas. The antennas put out a signal that's comparable to a cell phone in some sense. So that signal can travel a certain distance once it's launched up in the air. Any further questions from the audience here? Are there any uh, health risks to uh, this radar being utilized? Well, yeah, that's a good question. You know, we have, um, looked into the energy output uh, these antennas and most of most of the time it's because we go into an area like when we went to nasa they were concerned about the amount of uh, of um, radio frequency energy that these things were being tr transmitting that could potentially in some way interfere with their very sensitive communications there and in very few cases, I've been asked that question about the health aspects, but I, I would say, you know, it's probably no worse than what you get from the cell phone usage. And the fact that you run a radar survey, you know, just a very small amount of time, you know, that you're out there actually using this equipment versus somebody who's on a cell phone all day long, like my son, maybe. <laughs> you know, I would say that, uh, you know, you're not really going to see too many adverse health effects from any kind of ground penetrating radar applications because it's like I said, it's about the same kind of power level as with the cell phone put out. In fact, I would think in some cases less. Okay, I'm going to field some questions from the online audience here. Uh, there was one question that probably came before the last question, also about the health effects. Um, and then another question was to um, she wanted to know uh, about the accuracy of the Kazon Bell uh, diameter estimate. And uh, for those kinds of devices, how accurate are they? And maybe you can give an estimate in, you know, inches or centimeters or feet or whatever. Well, depending upon, you know, how well you drill that borehole that's alongside of the, the caisson. And by that, I mean, is it, you know, good and vertical? Do we know it's, you know, it's its Y location is pretty much dead on over you know the entire length of the borehole axis. If that's you know assuming that that's really accurately done, and it can be done, it can be done with with very careful drilling. And taking that out of the equation, I would think that just with the GPR itself and uh, starting out at a known distance from the side that you could actually sort of empirically derive what would be a good velocity. I would think that you'd probably be able to get within conceivably, you know, a quarter of a foot or so, maybe, you know, maybe something in the order of um, three or four inches, you know, of, of accuracy, uh, you know, for the, the estimation of the, the diameter and shape. Great, thank you. Um, what, I'm leaving one last question, and it looks like we have a question in the room. This will be the last one. Um, in the very beginning of your presentation, you showed you were scanning some concrete wall. What was the purpose of this scan? And just thickness of wall or remarkage? Can you uh, generate with this um, technique or method uh, 
uh, 3D image of rebarkage inside the wall. And it was just sort of a general survey at the time to look at the thickness of the cement, really, uh, in that wall and the spacing of the rebar. And if we yes. could make some sort of estimation of the, the diameter of the, of the steel. So could you? No, not really. I mean, if I had more... Um, if I had other areas with, let's say, number 12 bars, number you know, four bars, number nine bars, I could probably, you know, make a, a sort of a, a, an evaluation of, you know, what, what we thought the diameter of the bars were just based on this, the size of these reflections along a consistent set of antenna movements across the surface. But that wasn't really the main thing here. It was just to get some information you know, prior to doing them doing some kind of building on that surface. 